So students, today you are going to start a new topic that is a special kind of phase transformation known as cellular precipitation. But before I do that, let me again reiterate some of the important aspects of spinoidal decomposition. You remember I started with uh, such a kind of a phase diagram with a miscibility gap marked by a dome like picture. So, as you know, if I take an alloy with the composition x0, at the temperature T1, it will have a single phase alpha. Now, once I quench this alloy to T2, if this alloy is has any small composition fluctuations, the fluctuations will grow without any nucleation and microstructure will be typically of looking like a two phase microstructure decomposed from a single phase. And uh, so, and we have shown that this is this kind of phase diagram is a resultant of the free energy versus composition diagram shown at the bottom. Remember, these pictures are directly taken from the book of Porter and Sterling. And you see here there is a hump in the free energy curve. Not only that, I, I told you that the inside dotal curve, which is marked as a chemical spinoidal hair is basically defined by these two points where the double derivative of free energy respect to composition is 0. That means, the curvature is 0. It is very clear that there is a concave and there is a convex, convex curve and they meet at these points so therefore, curvature is 0. This is something which we start with it. Now, anything, any alloy composition which is uh, you know uh, which is lying uh, in the region between this dotted curve and the solid one that is from this point to this point or from this point to this point, transformation will happen by nucleation and growth. Basically that is the mode normally almost all the phase transformations undergo. So, now question is this and uh, how the things happen I told you this picture I have drawn in the last class that if you have a composition fluctuation then fluctuations grow and then you have a phase separator regions with the composition x2 and x1 uh, you know which is a reach and other one is b reach as seen in the phase diagram in the last picture also and this requires an affine diffusion that means diffusion of the atoms against the constant gradient that's why you call it affine diffusion but as i showed in the first lecture that this diffusion is is down the chemical potential gradient so therefore the diffusion happens down the chemical potential gradient, but it the way it takes place it looks like it happens up the concentration gradient. A goes to the A reach region, B goes to the B reach region. So, that is why it is called a compositional partitioning. And I discussed to you the free energy expressions as you said that you know this this you see here very clearly there is a wavelength of fluctuation. That means the composition fluctuations can be fitted with a particular sinusoidal or cosinusoidal or any other type of fluctuations. And that means there is a wavelength of fluctuations and that is very important. And wavelength of fluctuations basically is related to the characteristics time constant of the transformation which is given by minus lambda square by 4 pi d 4 pi square d. And I told you in the last lecture also that the interdiffusion coefficient d within this chemical spinoidal is negative. That is that is what is the meaning of the affine diffusion basically. Now, in order to know the wavelength, I discussed the last class about this, you have to know the wavelength of the compositional fluctuations, we need to develop free energy expressions. That there are three free energy, free energy uh, components, one is the chemical free energy part which is given by half double derivative of g with respect to x multiplied by delta x square where the delta x is the composition fluctuations. This is very simple because uh, you know there is no need of discussing the on this much more. Basically, once we have homogeneous phase decomposing into two phases, one with the x plus delta x, other one is x minus delta x compositions, or x0 plus delta x and x0 minus delta x, uh, that is what is written in the book. Then it is very easy to show that the chemical energy change 
will be um, uh, by this amount half of double derivative of g respect to x into delta x square. And as you know, there is always interfacial energy because of this compositional fluctuation. That is what I discussed in the last class, that is what is called gradient energy. And gradient energy, sorry, gradient energy is given by this expression. Okay. Gradient energy is given by, what is that? Yes, gradient energy is given by this expression delta g is equal to k delta x by lambda square, where delta x is the amplitude of the fluctuations and lambda is the wavelength and that means delta x by lambda is basically nothing but a compositional gradient, is it not? Because one is the composition, other is the length. So, that tells you a compositional gradient and the square of that multiplied by factor gives you the delta g uh, gamma that is the interpersonal energy of gradient energy term. And lastly, most important thing is that because of the composition fluctuation, there may be there may be difference of the uh, chemical uh, the uh, lattice parameters of the phases, and these can lead to what is known as strain energy or coherency strain energy. Sometimes people define that, and this obviously led to the misfit misfit of the lattice parameter that we know that I defined the last lecture also, and therefore G S or delta G S is given by the elastic constant or Young modulus multiplied by the delta square or delta is small delta is nothing but the uh, your misfit. Now, we can actually get an equation and finally, we showed you that the in the uh, limits of temperature and compositions the lambda when the lambda become infinity this condition to be satisfied and for anything for whatever lambda possible lambda is basically this condition to be satisfied you see these are balls down from this master equation of g delta g. So, thus minimum possible wavelength decreases in increasing under cooling below the Cohen spin model. Now, this equation which I showed you here delta g square by d x square equal to minus 2 uh, eta square e prime multiplied by v m. These parameters I have defined in the last class also, where v m is the molar volume e, e prime is basically e divided by 1 minus nu, where nu is the Poisson ratio and e is the elastic modulus or Young modulus and eta is nothing but a 1 by a d a by d x. Okay. So, therefore, if this line which is which the line which is defined by this equation is known as a coherence model, because it only talks about coherence strain with the available chemical potential a chemical free energy that is because lambda is infinity. So, therefore, there is no gradient energy term. So, uh, now I, I want to just discuss with you that these are these are the things which I discuss in detail. Now, we can actually do the analysis properly as you see here this is the chemical spin model ok or the, the sorry this is the uh, uh, chemical spin model you see here and within the chemical spin model you have a coherent spin model ok. And these actually solid lines which I tell you so incoherent miscibility gap and coherent miscibility gap ok. So, spin model decomposition is uh, uh, you know leads to all kinds of change or the lines in the phase diagrams, but you do not need to remember everything this uh, you need to only remember the miscibility gap that is defined by the dome and then you have within the dome you have a something known as a chemical spin model and then chemical spin model is given by the uh, condition that derivative double derivative g respect to x equal to 0 that means the curvature of the free energy curves is 0 and those for if I do this that, that kind of analysis you know which I shown you here if I do this kind of analysis for every temperature this is done as temperature T 2. If you do any temperature you will get these two points ok which is defined by the this equation double derivative of g respect to x to equal to 0 and then you can actually generate this chemical spin model. This is what is chemical spin model. Now, similarly if I use this equation this one double derivative of g respect to x at any temperature equal to this one that is the lattice parameter change which can give you the coherence strain, then we can actually get another uh, uh, set of points which can which provides us the coherence mineral. So, there are three important aspects which you must remember. One is this dome solid line okay, and that solid line tells you incoherence mineral. Okay. Then within that solid line you have a chemical spinel given by the double derivative of g s to x going to 0 for every temperature from the free energy curves and within this chemical spinel what you need to have is a and spinel. So, remember within the chemical spinel the phase transformation is given by growth no nucleation is required 
because it is a spontaneous process. Any fluctuations present in the material, composition fluctuations will grow without any barrier. But the compositions which are between incoherent and the chemical spiral we will have nucleation and growth. Transformation is same as like a precipitation, okay. From alpha, alpha 2 or alpha 1 will precipitate. So, there is no difference of the precipitation and these uh, transformation, whether any composition which is lying between the incoherent spinodal and the chemical spinodal. And within the chemical spinodal, we have something known as a coherent spinodal. That means, the spinodal which is dictated by the coherency strain, the phi and g available, chemical phi and g available for the system is completely spent in and basically this in taking care of the coherence strain because of the lattice parameter difference or the misfit between the two phases. These are actually uh, very general I am speaking, but you know because this is undergraduate or you know for the mostly undergraduate students and uh, some preliminary postgraduate students if you want to know in detail about see detail about this kind of things you need to go through the literature very, very nicely. And in this regard, I like to bring the work done by J. W. Khan, uh, long back 1950s, 60s and uh, to understand it. There are some papers available in literature, which is then the book also, you can read it. But fundamentally, this is a very important phase transformation, that is what you should remember. Okay, some of the microstructures which you have seen there, uh, this is this is R11, you can see here. There is a, a coarsen spiral microstructure for aluminum, zinc, magnesium alloy, which is hallucinated at, at 400 degrees Celsius for 2 hours and then edged at 100 degrees for 20 hours. And this is basically TM microstructure, you show the composition fluctuations very easily, although it is coarsen because it has it, the, the spiral decomposed zones has coarsened a little bit. Okay, so, I uh, will not talk about much of that other than saying that, that you need to study spinal decomposition a little seriously because this is something which you have not been subjected to or you have not been taught in your previous curriculum. Okay, that wraps up the spinal decomposition part. Now, I just uh, start the uh, whatever time I have, I will just start this uh, new transformation which is known as cellular precipitation. You know, I discuss a lot about precipitations. Remember, uh, that precipitation is one of the major root of transformations. Aluminum copper, aluminum copper silicon, aluminum magnesium, many any alloys undergoes nickel aluminum undergoes precipitation type of phase transformation and these are very important because this is one of the unique way of imparting strength to the material. And I discuss uh, extensively on this part for aluminum copper, aluminum, mag aluminum silver systems I remember. So, but things are similar. So, now uh, for the next few lectures what I am going to take at the last part of this course, I will going to concentrate on some special phase transformations. Okay. There are many facial phase transformations, but it is not possible for me to discuss all of them. I will take few ones. Okay. First, I will take the thing of cellular precipitation. It is there in the book of Prota Sterling as well as of the Gina and Chaturvedi. You can read it in detail manner. So, uh, you know gain boundary precipitation, cellular precipitation is related to gain boundary precipitation. In fact, it is related to gain boundary migration also. So, gain boundary precipitation does not always uh, need to happen or need to uh, always result in gain boundary phases or would make certain patterns. You know, uh, as you as uh, probably you have, if you go back to my lectures on the certificate or the sorry, the uh, phase transformation sequence of the hypo or hyperutectoid steels. Then you have seen that in for the hyperutectoid steel, the alpha phase, which is proutectoid phase or primary alpha, proutectoid alpha that is better way to define, forms along the gain boundaries of the existing austenite, because the composition of the steel is less than 0 0.76 weight percent of carbon. So, therefore, uh, the, the, the transformation will begin with the formation of alpha from the gamma austenite. Similarly, if you go on the hyperutectoid sides, the transformation will begin with the precipitation of the cementite. And you see, if you see the look at the microstructures which I have shown in you previously, the cementite basically forms the discontinuous precipitates on the gain boundaries of the existing gamma. 
and because cementite is a carbon rich phase that is how the carbon of the austenite is reduced before it reaches the eutectoid transformation temperature. And that is therefore, the remaining austenite whatever will be remained with the chemical compositions of 0 0.776 weight percent carbon will be transformed to pyrolite at a temperature less than about 100 and 727 degrees Celsius temperature. Okay. So, but you know this uh, this is one way of precipitating phases along the gain boundaries or but it does not mean that this will always happen. Okay. And I also showed you that some of these alpha proyectoid alpha can form with my statin like a plate like things it is just like you have a gain boundary if you have a gain boundary then it forms along the gain boundary as a if this is the gain boundary it forms like along the gain boundary then this kind of plates happen and form. So, this is ex, this is alpha proyectoid alpha okay. and this is basically called Widman Stratton alpha because this looks like a forms like a plate. Okay. This is alpha plates and this is a, the gamma 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 boundary. Okay, that is the uh, one way or it can actually happen like a precipitate along the boundary between that cementite also forms that way. But you know gain boundary precipitation does not always lead to gain boundary aleatorium ops or, or the Widmer statin. Okay. There are different modes of transformations and cellular precipitation is one of those. Essential feature of this transformation is this, this picture as you see here figure 5.50 in the book of proton installing is that this transformation is that boundary on which this precipitation happens it moves along with the precipitation. In case of those two transformation I told you would must start and the cell and the precipitates of the primary or proyectoid alpha or cementite basically the gain boundary does not move, but here gain boundary moves that is what is shown in this picture. So, uh, the transformation is that boundary moves along with the going tips of these going tips of these precipitates and this loops leads to cell like feature you see this is cell correct. In solidification cell cells form cells and then cells breaks down to it and dry that is why it is called a cellular transformations. The transformation uh, equation is exactly same uh, alpha going to alpha prime plus beta okay, the same where alpha uh, sorry alpha prime going to not alpha. So, alpha prime is a super saturated solid solution and alpha is basically these you know equilibrium or rather phase with the lower thermodynamic excess of solid and beta is basically equilibrium precipitates. So that means, if you have a super saturated alpha prime it is the beta precipitates out of the alpha and leading to alpha having less solid presentations. Okay. So, uh, now question is that uh, the this kind of mechanism by which this transformation happen is still debated it is not yet understood. Uh, as I told you just I will in a, another uh, you know couple of maybe 10, 15 minutes, 10 minutes time five sorry whatever time I have in this lecture I am going to show you few microstructure and try to probably try to explain you how things happens. You know uh, the gain boundary uh, mechanism by which the gain boundary nucleation develops into cellular precipitates it differs from one alloy to other alloy that is the one of the problem that is why it is not fully understood. You know let us look at uh, magnesium aluminum system which is widely studied. Magnesium aluminum phase diagram part of the phase diagram on the magnesium end is shown here you see here this is a liquid then alpha and the beta. Okay. Now, if I take an alloy composition is about close to 0.1 percent of aluminum or 0.1 mole fraction of aluminum and start cooling it down then beta, beta will precipitate it is very clear because at high temperature it is a single phase alpha super solid solutions. Now, if you cool it down beta must precipitate this is just like aluminum copper phase diagram looks like similarly. So, uh, but what actually happens you know uh, this picture is basically uh, shows you the precipitates of the magnesium 17 aluminum 12 this is this beta, beta has a very complex composition it is not a complex it is basically intermediary that is why and it alloy composition is a magnesium 9 atom percent aluminum it was uh, solutionized I think at 410 degrees Celsius temperature to make it completely alpha followed by quenching 
quenching I think it is quench given two shape basic hallucinized and then quench to 220 degrees 220 degrees somewhere there ok here 220 degrees and then aged aged uh, for about say I think uh, 20 minutes at 200 ok and then followed by so the aging at done was at 277 degree oh sorry what I am saying yeah it was first solution treated at 900 410 then quenched to temperature 220 for 20 minutes followed by 90 seconds at 277 degrees Celsius finally water quenched. So 220 then again heated up to 277 that is close to 300 somewhat there ok then it was quenched. So now the uh, the picture looks like a uh, eutectoid eutectic solidification ok you see here but what you see here this was the prior gain boundary between the two phases between the two grains of alpha that is alpha alpha ok. But then beta precipitates along the gain boundary but as you see here the beta precipitates the gain boundary moves and it develops cells right you can clearly see that it develops cells I can draw and show you that few of them and then obviously cells have grown you can see here this is a precipitates these are the precipitates which are formed and it looks like a eutectoid transformation, but it is not uh, the, the pancreastructure looks like. Okay, so, uh, then what actually happens? The growth of the precipitates as you know requires wire. This is a diffusional transformation that means you are forming a phase beta which is a distinct different composition as compared to alpha. So, to form that uh, to, to precipitate it out you need diffusion of the solids most importantly diffusion of aluminum that is required. So now question is this the growth of the cellular precipitates required partitioning basically or partitioning your solute to at the tips of the precipitates ok because it, this is growing into a and into the gain boundary. So this requires these solid partitioning at the tips of the boundaries. My question is this uh, that means that boundary has a role right very importantly obviously gun boundaries are the important regions of the base pass formation there is a nucleation or it is a growth gain boundaries play them very important role. So now the question is this this can occur in two ways obviously if you think it one by lattice diffusion ok. How yeah it through the lattice from the through the bulk of the phase it can happen the, diff, the, the diffusion or the partitioning of the solids which, which is basically done by diffusion this can happen or it can happen along the gain boundaries things can actually diffuse on the gain boundaries. But you know uh, the studies which are done uh, very nicely which I will discuss in the next class in detail later on showed that it is not the lattice diffusion rather it is the diffusion along the gain boundaries which plays role which is have more governing uh, features over that. So, partitioning by lattice diffusion requires solid concentration gradients out of the cell boundary obviously. When something is growing uh, like uh, by lattice diffusion it requires a compositional gradient ahead of the gain boundary otherwise this partitioning will not happen. But on the other hand if it is happening diffusion happening through the gain boundaries so because precipitates is sitting the tip of the precipitate sitting at the gain boundaries. So, this can gain boundary can act as a channel for the transport of the solids to reach at the tip of the precipitates and the precipitates can go further and this is the reason why the gain boundary moves along the precipitates because gain boundary is feeding gain boundary is acting as a feeding channel for the solids partitioning and uh, that is why the gain boundary has to move because if the gain boundary is stagnant the precipitate will move ahead that is what happened in Rudman certain plates precipitates nucleates at the gain boundary then they grow like a plate. So, when they grow like a plate diffusion is happening because at, at, at the in the grain within the grain and this diffusion happens because of the compositional gradient which has developed uh, you know ahead of the precipitate or ahead of the with uh, certain plates right. But here the precipitate is always present or the tip of the precipitate is present along the, on the gain boundary ok it is like like this ok let me go back to this picture. But the precipitate is always present tip of the precipitate is always present at the gain boundary tip of the gain boundary. So, what I mean gain boundary which is which is uh, you know which is the uh, better 
by now faster path of diffusion for the solids can actually feed, can act as a feeding channel for the solids to reach at the tip of the precipitates and the precipitates then grow. As the precipitates grow, it takes along the gain boundary, along with it. And that is why the gain boundary actually move from D to C to D, because the gain boundary is slowly moving into, into that. And gain boundary moves to one of the grains. And this is this is very fascinating kind of phase transformations. Okay. I will not discuss the way things happens. Let me just show you one picture before I stop today that uh, you know here this is basically a shell form which this is basically again aluminum magnesium alloy. Uh, this is then aging treatment at two temperatures one at 220 degree Celsius temperature for 30 minutes and it was followed by 277 at this again 30 minutes and then obviously it is water quench and you see this is the alpha grain. Okay. And this is the uh, you know beta precipitates, the black black color ones you can see here, black color things which are beta precipitates. And this was the gain boundary, and they form like a cell, right? You can see here. This is better here. See, this is the gain boundary. The moir fringes are observed in the gain boundary because this is a transmiss electron micro gap. So now, uh, as these precipitates grow, they are taking the gain boundary along with it. And that is only possible when the, the, the solids actually uh, diffuses through the gain boundary, gain boundary access channel for the solid diffusions. Well, uh, the, the detailed proof of this how this precipitation is governed by gain boundaries has been done. I will discuss you in the next lecture and then I will start on the transformation happenings in the next lecture itself.